Worried about your home's furnace or AC? Not anymore. Legacy Heating and Air wants to make it easy for you to stay comfortable year-round. Right now, when you buy a new heating and cooling system from Legacy, we'll give you the complete package worry-free. Get a free smart thermostat, a free duct cleaning, flexible financing, and free maintenance for up to 12 years. This deal won't last long. Call your Legacy Pro today or schedule online at LegacyHeatingAndAirInc.com. A Cook Family Business. Welcome to Football Never Sleeps, the aspiring to be viral Notre Dame football show with the mesmerizing countdown and the wonderful sponsor in Legacy Heating and Air. I'm Eric Hansen. The guy staring at you blankly in the other box is Tyler James. And we'll be talking Notre Dame football for at least the next hour. You may spill a little bit over because we have so much to talk about today as Notre Dame hits a little bit beyond the halfway point in its spring practice schedule number nine today, this morning on a beautiful day when the weather in South Bend got up to over 70 degrees for the second day in a row, which is a much bigger deal here than the eclipse was. Um, we would like to take your questions during the show. We'll work them in. And there's all kinds of other things like likes and bells and whistles and that kind of stuff. Tyler's better at that than me. So take it away, Tyler. All right. Yeah. If you are new to YouTube and I'm staring blankly because I'm trying to get the butts in the seats, Eric, I, I've got to got to promote us on social media, make sure people show up. We're on Tuesday. We got some, we got some comments from folks, Brian and Jason that were commenting yesterday uh, assuming that we were going to be live <laughs> yesterday evening. Uh, so Brian and Jason, uh, apologies for not uh, giving you more of a heads up. I tried to put it out earlier on Monday. Um, so folks knew, but obviously you got to pay attention to what the actual date says. But um, yeah, so if you're new to the YouTube experience, make sure that you've clicked through so you can uh, enter our comments or ask, ask us questions during the show. Um, you can do that. Um, by making sure that you are either on the YouTube app or at a YouTube site. Do not try to talk to us if you're watching us embedded on social media or uh, if uh, you're watching us from InsideIndieSports.com. You won't be able to talk to us that way. So make sure you've clicked through to do that. Um, make sure you are subscribed to our channel here on YouTube to make sure that you don't miss any of our future content. And you can obviously go back and see any of our old content as well. Um also, if you are not a subscriber to InsideNDSports.com, uh, make sure you take advantage of our 30-day free trial to InsideNDSports.com. Um, that is, unless you uh, beat everyone on our staff in the Inside Indie Sports Bracket Challenge, uh, I finished 30th, representing the high mark for our staff, um, which isn't was isn't the greatest. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't take UConn. It could have saved us a lot of free uh, subscription months by. Uh, um, picking UConn to win, but that, that wasn't the case. Um, but if you uh, haven't taken advantage of a free trial yet, try it, try it out. We have plenty of recruiting news coming up um, this time of year and obviously plenty of coverage of the finish of Notre Dame spring practice. You can use promo code NDYT, which is an exclusive code for our YouTube audience. Uh, when you sign up to get the 30-day free trial, that gets you access to our premium analysis, all of our recruiting coverage, and special access to us over on the Insider Lounge where we spend – a lot of our time and share our inside information first. Uh, there is a link to sign up for that deal in the video description below. Uh, I think that's everything for me, Eric. Let's get it rolling. Okay, so we're taking stock of Notre Dame football as the Irish completed practice 9-15 of uh, Tuesday with a pivotal scrimmage ahead later this week on the way to the Blue Gold game, which is another scrimmage, not as pivotal, but very public set for 1 p.m. Eastern time, April 20th at Notre Dame Stadium. So our opening drive tonight is quarterback talk. Uh, we got to see three and three quarters quarterbacks in action today. We had Steve Angeli with the ones, Kenny Minchie with the twos, C.J. Carr with the threes, and Riley Leonard intermittently um, practicing today. And we also had a chance to talk to all of those guys except for C.J. Carr. So we got a health update on Riley Leonard. So let's start with that. But we want to put Steve Angeli front and center as well since he is taking the number one snaps right now. So from Riley Leonard's standpoint, he's undergone two surgeries 
on his right ankle since enrolling at Notre Dame in mid-January. The first one was a tightrope surgery, a tightrope procedure on his ankle ligaments from a high ankle sprain way back in September when he was actually facing Notre Dame. So that was in late January. And then in on March 22nd to address a stress fracture that was forming and was caused by an inserted plate. Um, so Tyler, let's start with Leonard first, and we're going to shift pretty quickly to Steve Angeli. So what did we see Riley Leonard do in practice number nine on Tuesday? And what are the reasonable expectations of what we can, what he can get out of practices 10 through 15? Yeah, I, we saw him throwing passes, even doing a drill uh, where it, the quarterbacks, they were handing it off to running backs. Then they sort of catch a ball from Gino Gadouli, sort of like a snap, and then roll out and make a throw on the run. Now, Riley Leonard wasn't exactly doing uh, an intense rollout and throw on the run. Um, but that sort of explains just exactly how much he's doing. Like, he's not just standing around throwing a football. He's moving around and throwing. He's doing dropbacks. Um, Gino Gadouli even said he did, was doing some seven-on-seven, seven, which happened after we were escorted out for, for our allotted time of practice. Um, so uh, they're getting Riley Leonard as many opportunities as they can. Um, Gino Gadouli talked about. Uh, it's important that he has a way to sort of make up the time he's missing with those receivers and seven on seven is one of the ways that he can do that. Um, so I think we'll probably, we won't see much more of that because I think we're, we're not going to see a lot more of practice other than this coming weekend, but we we will, I think that's what we'll expect for to be happening behind closed doors with Riley Leonard as, as they move forward with, with, with the rest of spring practice. Yeah, I had a chance. I was one of the people that had a chance to talk to Riley Leonard. He was kind of a surprise on the interview schedule today. Yeah, and I was. So I, I was. I, so I was talking to Steve Angeli, and he, I the table where Riley Leonard sat was where I had just been talking to Drake Bowen. And so then I heard people talking. I was like, I thought Drake left, and I turned around. And it was Riley Leonard sitting there. I was like, Oh man, that's uh, that's good news for us. So uh, I'm glad you were able to, to to snag some time with him. Well, I'll give you kind of the. Um, the ABCs of what's going on with him. Then we're going to jump to Steve Angeli, and we'll circle back to Riley a little bit later maybe. But basically what caused the stress fracture, according to Riley, is that the plate was kind of the wrong size that they put in. And even then, it's very rare that it would cause a problem. Well, it, he happened to be the exception to the rule. It caused a problem with him and was causing a stress fracture. Now, everything that had been done in the tightrope procedure in January was fine, which was really ligament repair. And that still looked really good when they went back in, put a larger plate in. Um, right now, he's wearing something called a Taco brace, which was invented by a Notre Dame guy named Mike Bean. It's an over-the-shoe brace. And Riley said, you know, basically he actually feels better when he doesn't have the brace on. He said he's not in any pain at all and he's just wearing it in case he steps into a hole or I guess falls down the stairs when he's leaving a class. And that's happened to Notre Dame quarterback before. But anyways, his feel about this is that just after spring practice ends is when he feels like the doctors are hinting to him that he will be 100% that he's not going to have to wear a brace, that he's not going to have to think about the ankle, and that he's not going to have to be asked questions about it. So his chances of playing in the blue game, blue gold game are not very good and, and would seem to be too much of a risk. He said really the only risk at this point is him maybe trying to do too much. And that's kind of his nature, kind of what got him in trouble last year with Duke was trying to come back and help his team too much. So he's going to have to be patient with that. Uh, but right now, everything is going according to, to plan. And so the summer becomes really big for Riley Leonard in terms of his competing for the job. Right now, though, Steve Angeli, who Tyler talked to, is competing for the job. And I thought his interview had a lot of interesting elements to it. And I'm wondering what stuck out to you, Tyler, and then I may fill in some if you're not interesting enough. 
Uh, well, <laughs> hopefully I'm interesting. Uh, and uh, the interesting aspects were the questions I asked him <laughs> um, from the Steve Angeli interview. Um, but I talked to him a little bit about uh, competing with Riley Leonard. And he he's, he's, was pretty open. He's like, hey, I'm still competing with him now, even though he's not taking reps in the same way. Like, it's still a, a competition between us. And um, he's very self-focused on improving um, but he's well aware that that Riley Leonard is the person that he's competing with for that starting job. Um, he gave a lot of credit to Gino Gadulli for his development. Um, he Sam uh, Hartman too. Yeah, expressed a lot of respect for Sam Hartman and and what he's been able to do with that. Uh, his foot, Steve Angeli mentioned his footwork is something he's improved upon the most, um, and something that really dictates his accuracy. Um, I asked him about. How do you think about handle the transfer portal? And he said his entire focus is on Notre Dame right now. He's a guy that lives in the present. Um, he said, the this is the direct quote, the future can be determined when we get there. It's not my worry right now. All I'm focused on is these next five, six practices that we have left in spring and just give it my all. So, And I even asked him if anyone's tampered. Um, and he, he repeatedly said no. I, I didn't know. I didn't think he'd admit that, but I figured it's worth at least asking because um, I'm sure – in some way or fashion, someone has uh, reached out to Steve Angeli or people around Steve Angeli to get a, a sense of if he's staying at Notre Dame. In, in addition to that, and I, those are all great questions, and that was interesting. I'm just teasing Tyler, but a, a few things jumped out at me as well. The How big the Sun Bowl was, not only for his confidence, but for the team's confidence in him. There seems to, and again, this is all the more reason the team needs to see Riley Leonard be the better quarterback on the practice field and why you can't just say, oh, well, he's healthy. He's number one. They need to see him perform, and they need to see him outperform, I think, Steve Angeli. thought it was interesting, too, that he credited Lauren Lando, the new director of football performance, with more strength helping him have better velocity on his throws. And then um, – also, I thought it was interesting that they're not taking any snaps under center, um, that this was all shotgun now in the Mike Denbrock offense. So all those were kind of neat wrinkles. And Gino Gadouli, I thought, was <laughs> really interesting. Some of the most interesting stuff was about C.J. Carr, which we'll get to in a little bit. But I thought your question was really good about how do you keep everybody happy in the transfer portal era and do you want to summarize his answer to you, Tyler? Yeah, yeah. He said he obviously first he wants to be transparent with everyone. Um, he wants to he, he said he wants to treat those guys um, as he would want someone to treat his son um, in terms of being a coach. So um, he talked about like they don't really talk about the depth chart in the room because if you're recruiting quarterbacks to Notre Dame that are smart enough to play quarterback and good enough to play quarterback at Notre Dame, they should have a pretty good sense of where they are uh, in the pecking order based on how practice are going, knowing what their teammates are doing, um, the grades they're getting. Um, so it's not necessarily something that he has to spell out um, in the depth with a depth chart um, because obviously the reps are, are, are uh, parsed out in a certain way. Um, and obviously the results uh, should speak for themselves. So um, he uh, is very focused, like I, like I mentioned with Steve Angeli, like he's pounding into these guys' heads that it's like, you, yes, you're in a competition with Riley Leonard or Steve Angeli, but you're really competing with yourself in terms of trying to get better. Um, and so try not to focus too much on someone else. Um, but uh, I think it's a good – perspective i don't know that it's necessarily going to prevent anyone from leaving if they want to leave yeah because i don't know that there's really anything you can do in that circumstance but um i think it, it, it's a wise way to handle it. It, it and it comes off pretty genuine as well and i i would imagine that the quarterbacks feel sort of the same way i thought it was interesting too all the quarterbacks were asked in different ways about the mike denbrock offense uh, I thought Kenny Minchie's answer might have been the most interesting way of kind of looking at it. He said a lot more is in the quarterback's hands in terms of checking out of bad plays or flipping to a different formation mm -hmm. to take advantage of the defense and that 
this is an offense designed for explosive plays, and part of the recipe for getting there is to make those adjustments at the line of scrimmage, which seems like they have a lot more um, control of that than Sam Hartman did with uh, last year's offense. So that, that was interesting too. Tyler, do we want to take any questions here at this point or keep rolling with our quarterback talk? Uh, we can. I think there's at least one or two quarterback-related questions in here, so let's get those uh, in. Um, first one from Brian Habermel. I'm going to be – oh, this was Brian from yesterday saying that he would be able to listen live. So I don't, hopefully Brian is here again tonight. If not, uh, apologies. Where would you rank Steve Angeli's arm strength? Would it compare to Ian Book or Tommy Reese? Um, I would say better than Tommy Reese and probably maybe a little bit better than Ian Book. Um, I need to see more of it. <laughs> but – and just watching him, I mean, Tommy Reese had Michael Floyd. And you, you look at Michael Floyd's numbers the year that Tommy was a starter and Michael was the top receiver there. And his yards per catch went way down because Tommy couldn't get push it down the field quite like uh, some of the other quarterbacks. But I think Steve, Ange I mean, there's nothing wrong with Steve Angeli's arm strength. I would say when you look at, all four of them, you don't see somebody that's below average in arm strength. Yeah, I, I would compare. I think Angeli's in the Ian Book range. I think that that's probably an apt comparison um, in terms of arm strength. I, I don't know that he would be someone that could consistently throw the deep ball with incredible accuracy. Um, I think part of Ian Book's, Ian's Book's bigger problem, in my opinion, wasn't that, that he didn't have the arm strength. It was that he was get gun he got gun shy and didn't always let it loose um and so um that obviously we haven't seen enough of steve angeli in games to to dictate or determine it, how he handles that those situations obviously looks really good against oregon state in the sun bowl but um that was part part of the Ian book experience is you had so much to pick apart because he played the starting quarterback at notre dame for so long all right, Jeff Stevens asked, Mike Denbrock talked about a sort of video game virtual reality program that the quarterbacks could use for learning the offense. Any more info on how much that is used? Um, Do I you have any info? Riley Leonard got asked about it, and I was just way more focused on finding out what was going on with his ankle, so I really didn't. I moved that line of questioning away pretty quickly. Yeah, so oh, I don't know. I didn't see what Riley Leonard said. Mike Denbrock was asked about it and talked about it, but the way that he spoke about it didn't make it seem like Notre Dame has it currently. Um, he sort of I didn't get the it. idea that they did either. It's something yeah. that it's something that Mike Denbrock used, or not. I don't. I don't even know if it was Mike Denbrock's idea. I don't think it was. Uh, it was something that LSU used with Jaden Daniels um, and some other folks down. Obviously, the other quarterbacks. Uh, and so um, that's what Jeff is referencing there. I included it in the notebook that I did on Mike Denbrock on Saturday. Um, but in terms of how much it's used, it's zero at Notre Dame. I, I don't know if my, Jeff want, would like some context for like nationally. I don't, I don't have any context for that. But um, as far as I know, to date, it, it's not something that Notre Dame is actively using. But it sounds interesting. I think it's interesting. Yeah. And, uh, Mike Denbra, I can sort of give, give some more of the details in case people didn't read the story. It just it sort of can put the quarterback didn't. put the quarterback in the in the stadium in the situations they want them to learn from, be able to make reads, get comfortable in the situations. That Mike Denbra can say like something as simple as uh, being put in a way stadium so you know where the play clock is. And you can just sort of locate it, and it's not something that you're searching for on game day. Just different ways to get. Um, people sort of in the in the mindset of what it will be like playing either in a place or against certain defenses and stuff like that. The one interesting thing for me, having been here for all three iterations of Mike Denbrock at Notre Dame, is how much more I notice his voice at practice <laughs> than I ever have before. It's louder. It's more forceful. Um, he's all business. I mean, he's a super, super nice guy, but there is a sense of urgency in his voice. And uh, 
was interesting. I also spent a little bit of time over by the offensive lineman, and I heard Joe Rudolph speaking Harry He stand for the first time today. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of an interesting development. I was gonna um, say, yeah, it's easier to it's easier for your voice to stand out when you're not sharing a field with Harry He stand. And yeah, Notre Dame's yeah. offensive coaches aren't like very demonstrative. Not that they're not stern, but I wouldn't describe any of them as like yellers by any stretch. Um obviously there's yeah. times where that happens, but it's not like, oh, there's so and so yelling again. That's I, I wouldn't describe uh, any of the offensive coaches like that. Now, granted, some of them are newer, and we haven't seen them for a long time. But um, right, that that is interesting. When we um, when we talked to Gino Gadouli today, uh, the quarterbacks coach, I thought one of the more interesting facets of that conversation was about CJ Carr. And the fact that he learned a lot about C.J. Carr by them playing basketball against each other mm -hmm. and how competitive C.J. Carr was. He said, I thought he was just going to sag off me. And this guy's bodying up on me. And he's like, OK, I'm I'm into this. This guy is serious about being a competitor. And, and C.J. Carr, I'm telling you, he's he's being developed. He's coming along. Riley Leonard being, you know, partially available is benefiting both Menchie and Carr. So there is an upside to some of this in terms of future development and getting uh, more snaps. And Kenny Menchie actually spoke to it as well. So I thought that was pretty interesting. The That competitive piece, not just basketball necessarily, but they do a lot of stuff with recruits, especially guys that are committed to get a sense of their competitiveness and how, to, uh, how, how they handle situations like that with different games. Like it's not like – they're not putting them through like a combine workout or anything like that, but they do um, outside of the camp settings. Obviously, if you come to Notre Dame camp, they're going to ask you to, to compete in that way. But if you're just coming for a visit um, on some, some of the visits, they'll have different yard games and different things that they'll come up with to try to get the kids um, in competitive situations and, and want to learn a little bit about them that way too. So we're going to move on to linebackers. That was the other position group that we had interviews with today. We had a chance to speak with linebackers coach Max Bulla. There were, I believe, four linebackers that came up for interviews today. Jack Kaiser, Drake Bowen, Jaden Osbury, and um, Jalen Sneed. And Tyler spoke with Drake Bowen. So why don't we start there? He is in the mix to be the starting middle linebacker. And in the mix to be a pinch runner in baseball. So, what did you learn from speaking with Drake today? Yeah, well, he's only been pinch runner in games that Notre Dame wins, so that means he's not getting a lot of use <laughs> these days. <laughs> uh, sorry to the baseball program. They, but, uh, they need him to be a pitcher and not a <laughs> uh, pinch runner and an outfielder. Um, but I, it was interesting because we we were talking about the balancing act of football and baseball. Um, and he made it clear football is the priority to him um, right now. Like the opportunities that present himself in both sports, like he's not looking to be a pinch runner on the football team right now. He's looking to be the starting middle linebacker. So the opportunities there, he's taking it that seriously. Tuesday is when he normally gets a rest day during with his with the schedule that they've worked out. Um, he made it seem like there may be some football and baseball things that are happening on those days, but he, he, it's optional for him. Like he can just, he can just rest, but the way practice was set up for football this week, I think in part because of the eclipse on Monday, um, Notre Dame uh, football team practiced on Tuesday. And so he was out there on Tuesday, which is today. I know not everyone watches us on Tuesday, but, or when we're live, but um, so I thought that was impressive. Um, he, he admitted that it is, it can be a little challenging at times to stay engaged with baseball when so much focus is on, on football and the, the playing time isn't really coming w w on the baseball diamond. Um, it's not, it seems like he's holding up physically. He's mentally expanding his game. Um, the big, big thing he talked about was like last year was about learning his position and getting all the details uh, down at, at, of playing linebacker this spring has been about sort of knowing what the others around him are doing and how that all works together. Um, and so it sounds like things are clicking with him. I, I would not say like, this is a done deal and he's for sure the starting middle linebacker, but um, I think he's in the best position to do that. He's certainly being pushed by Kingston Villiamuasa, who Max linebackers coach Max Bola has also spoken highly about. Um, so it was, it was good to catch up with Drake today and see um, how he's handling things. And um 
understanding the situation that he's in. So if there was a, a game today, the starting linebackers would be Drake Bowen, Jack Kaiser, and Jalen Sneed. And I think we're going to see maybe as many as six play significant roles or rotations. So Kingston and Billy Amuasa would be in that, as you mentioned. But the guy that's really, I think, very intriguing, I had a chance to sit down and talk with today, and the coaching staff feels like he's intriguing, is Jaden Osbury, who came to Notre Dame kind of as a, in a tweener size, as a safety linebacker size. He is very much a linebacker size now. And he has been so impressive in the practices. They're like, okay, we need to get him on the field somehow, some way. He needs to have roles. And so they've, they're looking at him in a bunch of roles. And he was talking about this. He is a rover and he watches film of Jeremiah Uusu Koromoa, who has been Notre Dame's best rover, a guy that was a three down linebacker as a rover. Um, he's also playing the Aztec position, which DJ Brown would play in certain packages last year. It's actually called the spear package. And it's a, it's a extra defensive back package. So he, he is in the box with another safety, Adon Schuler right now. Um, and there are other different roles. He's played some nickel for them and they really love him in all these roles. And he's pretty excited about where his career is going right now. He, he mentioned that, and, and Max had brought this up about a month ago that, he got stuck on scout team at the beginning of last year and he wasn't really very happy about it. Yeah. And then he realized that he was going against some really good college players and Joe Alt, Blake Fisher, Audric Estime. And he thought, you know what? My growth can really be accelerated by this role. So then he began to look forward to the scout team and then he played his way off of it eventually. And now he's going to be in the rotation. So he's, 6'2", he's in the 220s now, trying to get up to 225, 227 for the season. And I think he's a guy to really keep an eye on, even if he's not a starter. I think we'll see a lot of Jaden Osbury. What are your yeah. thoughts on Jaden? Yeah, I think that's intriguing. I liked how what Max Bola said about finding ways to get him on the field. Like it, he... You mentioned four to six. I would imagine Osbury is four, right? Like I think he's yeah. that fourth linebacker um, uh, in terms of trying to get uh, find roles to use him. Um, balancing like the potential of Jalen Sneed and Jaden Osbury seems like a little bit of a, a juggling act. How do you figure out ways to get those guys on the field, especially when you're going to play so much nickel? Um, and so I, I'm intrigued to see what to see that. Um, Bully even said, like, he's open to different roles and different niches for guys. And um, so I, I think that is promising for, for Notre Dame to get as much of its linebacker talent on the field, which it does have a lot of talent. It's not necessarily proven talent, um, but it does have a lot of talent. I think um, I think a lot of Notre Dame fans, even even the ones that really like J.D. Bertrand and Maris Leofau, um, are excited to see some new faces playing linebacker for the Irish and see what those kids can do. Um, Jalen Sneed did his interview today, and he's uh, Max Bola was really um, complimentary of him. Felt like between bowl practices and middle of spring practice, no one has been more locked in at linebacker and getting their game up to speed than Jalen Sneed. So he was really, really happy with, and I'd say Al Golden seemed to reflect those comments and or or echo those comments i don't know that he reflected them but he echoed those comments and um so this is an important spring for jalen and he realizes that and he he voiced that i think it's also interesting sometimes uh players talk uh get asked about offensive players and i thought jalen sneed and i think it was stevie and jelly both mentioned Micah Gilbert as somebody that's impressed them. So I yeah. thought I'd throw that in there. Um, one more thing about Jay Osbury too. I asked him at the end about Lauren Lando, the new director of football performance and his eyes lit up and he just said, 
you know, the way that he's helped him become linebacker size and yet uh, the speed and be stronger. And he said a big thing, you know, maybe that the media doesn't talk about is recovery. How, how good the recovery system is in terms of them, you know, not being aching by the time they go to their next practice and they're able to give their full potential in each practice. So the recovery piece seems to be really important under Lauren Lando. All right. I got a few questions here. If I can throw those in for us. Sure. Um, Jeff Stevens asked, will Notre Dame use the helmet communication in the blue gold game or will it be a hybrid to include running in plays? Uh, Tyler, do you have the answer to it? I can tell you what Al Golden mentioned, but we didn't talk specifically about. Blue yeah, gold I, yeah, game. I didn't ask what they'll do in the blue gold game. I would imagine they would use it in the blue gold game. Um, I they're using it in practice. Um, yes. I think I think by the blue gold game around then is when we'll know for certain uh, if that is passed for next season. I think there's still some like formal process that it has to go through, but um, I think it makes a lot of sense, e- even if it is isn't passed and something is of the, of the future. If it's, if they've been using it all spring, it would make a lot of sense to at least use it for the spring game um, and and, uh, continue to do that um, for the blue gold game. So when I um, had a chance to talk to Al Golden on Saturday, you know, he has worked with us before because he was in the NFL for the six years before he came back to college and the Notre Dame's defensive coordinator He said right now where they're at with it is it cuts off after 15 seconds. That's the rule or that's the proposed rule right now. And he said, if that's how it's going to be implemented, then they're going to have to do both. They're going to have to have helmet communications and they're going to have to have some kind of signaling on the side because obviously um, whether let's, let's do it from the offensive perspective the defense is moving around and they may change their alignment they may all of a sudden show blitz and and you have to have a way to communicate with the quarterback to hey check this out so they're going to have to do some signaling but the crux of it will be the helmet communications and again maybe they'll tweak the rule so that it doesn't cut off after 15 seconds what the NCAA doesn't want it to be is like the coach in their ear, hey, look out for the guy blitzing <laughs> from the right side. You know, they don't want him coaching through the play, so there's going to have to be a cutoff at some point. Yeah, Mike Dembrock seemed fully on board with it. He didn't He didn't have any complaints, although I don't know. Uh, we didn't ask, like, pressing questions about uh, wh- how long it should last or anything like that, um, but he seemed to be on board, and he he said he likes it. And uh, the play he, – he likes it most because – it allows the player not to have to be like the quarterback to be focused on the signals. It can, the quarterback can be looking elsewhere and hear what Mike Dembrock is saying and being, and, and still evaluating things going on in the field or, and being able to look at player guys he's talking to and stuff like that. So I think uh, that aspect of it was something that Mike Dembrock uh, was appreciative of. All right. I got some more questions for us. Uh, Bob Bolt asks, hi guys, uh, Bob from Oxnard. I believe is a subscriber on the Insider Lounge that we see from time yes. to time. Uh, any clues on the severity of Jaden Harrison's injury? I don't know that. How about you? Uh, no, I, I just know that he was in a, a walking boot today at practice, was not practicing. Um, so I, I don't know the severity of that. I have not been able to, to get any details on that as of yet. But um, we'll see um, what that means for Jaden Harrison. If it's a short-term injury, long-term injury, he, he was – out doing workouts uh in the pit and stuff and so if if it if it were like something that serious that he would not potentially he would miss the season or something like that i don't think he would have been out there today like in the way he was so um but i, I don't know, know exactly it, it wasn't like a smaller brace or boot on his foot like riley leonard was wearing it was it was a bigger brace so uh, maybe some something has to heal there until until he can get back out on the field and Riley Leonard actually talked about the differences. He said when they have the big walking boot, it's like walking on air. And this Taco brace really is, again, it's over the shoe. It's it's not like walking on air. It's like really basically doing everything. It's an extra layer of protection when you're out there. 
All right. Uh, Bleiberg asks, good evening, gentlemen. Thoughts on Sean Civilano? I have heard, heard he looks like a duck out of water. Okay. I have not heard him described as that. That's an awfully big duck. Um, (laughs) The thing that I like about Sean in what I've observed of him at this point, and he's, he's not at the bottom of the depth chart. I mean, he gets some reps maybe with the twos sometimes. And again, some of that is because we've been typically in on Wednesdays. Today was a Tuesday. And Howard Cross, I found out from his dad today, is taking a master's degree course. And that's why he misses some of the Wednesdays. And I would assume Riley Leonard's for the same thing. Or he just wants to hang out. Riley Mills. uh, That he just wants to hang out with Howard. Uh, But uh, Sean is super strong. And he's got a really good burst for a guy that size. And he's well over 300. There's not somebody else on the roster that kind of profiles like he does maybe Devin Houston is the closest but he's not anywhere near as big as Sean Sean if he were a little bit taller you'd say whoa this guy has some big time potential so we'll see how that plays out but I'm really intrigued by Sean Um, and again he gives you something at nose guard that Notre Dame doesn't have they don't have somebody that size yeah, I, I don't know where the feedback uh, or who who described him as a duck out of water. I, I we haven't seen a lot of parts of practice that would be important for defensive linemen. If I'm being frank, like that you would like we don't see them doing much physical stuff. They're doing individual drills, so I I don't know. That seems like a very uh, big statement to say about Sean Cevallano based on the, the stuff that we've seen in practice. Now maybe someone has heard that from someone on the staff, but. Um, I, I think uh, certainly he's got a long way to go in terms of getting onto the field and and um, earning that playing time because they're they are pretty deep at at the interior defensive line position even even when Howard Cross and Riley Mills are missed in practice. But um, but like Eric was mentioning, Sean looks a lot different than the, the defense interior defensive lineman that Notre Dame has on its roster, um, and so it's intriguing to see what what he can become and. Um, what's how they can sort of round him into shape. All right, TD4ND says, who will be the linebackers in playoff games in December? Will they rotate? Will three stand out? I'm convinced, having heard the linebackers talk today and also Max Boa, that there's going to be more rotation and some guys that have niche roles. And I, I think... I'm pretty confident in the, that the four that they had up for interviews today are going to be the four that play the most. I wouldn't rule out Kingston Villiamuasa from pushing into that rotation just because he's already athletically and physically college ready. And all the other linebackers talk about how he's been able to absorb so much information so quickly. So I would not write him off in that equation either. But I think the starters, since that was the question, would be uh, Drake Bowen and Jack Kaiser and Jalen Sneed. Yeah, to, to me, I mean, I, I who knows what it'll end up in December p- between now and then. Uh, health will probably play as much of a factor in that as anything. Um, but it's – I. Jalen Snead is a starter, but I don't think they're going to play a lot of Rover. I just, I don't, I can't see them lining up against the offense. Even if they're not playing the best offenses in the world, I don't think they're going to be able to play, play a Rover more than they did last year. Um, even if they think Jalen Snead is a better athlete than Jack Kaiser. Um, I, I, I think Osbury fits that particular role better, I think. But go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Um, I, so, but so, do you think Jaden Osbury would play more than Jack Kaiser did last year as a rover? No, but I think he's going to be on the field in maybe rover-like roles. Again, that Aztec safety. You know, he's playing some safety. He's playing some nickel. Um, but what I think might happen is they may slide the middle linebacker out and have Kaiser play the Mike and. 
Jalen Sneed play the will. I think that's still being worked on. That's kind of me reading between the lines, and maybe I misread that, but I think that's something that they're thinking about. Yeah, so what I was getting at is just like, I I don't know, like even referring to Jalen Sneed as the starting rover feels a little like, well, what does that even mean? Because I don't know how much the rover is going to play. I do think, I th- like you mentioned, the four guys will play. It's just a matter of what roles they find and w- what different combinations they use. I, I mean, I don't think that they're uh, locked into playing Jack Kaiser and Drake Bowen together necessarily all the time in a nickel package, for instance, like they could move Jalen Sneed inside or, or even Jay Nosbury inside. I think there's different things they can do there. So um, I do think the linebackers will have a successful season. I think they'll do some good things. Um, so I, I, it, there's, like we said earlier, there's lots to prove at linebacker, but um, I do think there's, there's definitely a lot of talent there as well. One thing we, we talked to tight ends um, among the groups on Saturday, tight ends and safeties. And Mitchell Evans was one of the guys we talked to who's recovering from an ACL, but he said, those young linebackers are fast. I mean, he goes, you really notice the speed with those guys. All right. We still got some more questions. So let's keep rolling through them. A Blyberg asked uh, on Saturday, do you guys get to watch the entire scrimmage? It's true. We do. And I think this, it's going to be more valuable than, the blue gold game in terms of our evaluations, because I think we're going to see real roles with real rules and guys competing because whoever wins that they get to be the blue jerseys for the next year, uh, or they get their choice of jerseys and the offenses won that Jersey scrimmage the last few years. I can't remember the last time the defense was blue, but, um, I think you're going to see a lot less, you know, vanilla that you get in the blue gold big game because there's cameras there and there's people watching the game. I think we're going to see a a lot in that game and hopefully have a lot to report. Cameras are not allowed at all, not even still shot cameras while they're stretching uh, on Saturday. Yeah. I'll only add that we, that's what we've been sold um, there have been plenty of times in the past where we say that we get an entire scrimmage and are like, well, we're going to ask you guys to leave. We got some stuff that we want to do uh, okay, without yeah. you guys here. So that is what we've been sold. Uh, we, I, I can't guarantee that they're going to let us stay the whole time, but that is what it is, is uh, as it's been uh, told to us so far. Um, let's go to Carberry since we've been heavy on Blyberg. We'll get back to the other Blyberg question. Uh not sure how much you guys have really seen, uh, but how is the O-line looking? Are they where they should be at this time, or the, do they need a lot more work? I think we're going to be saying they need a lot more work in August just because there's so much competition going on. And what Tyler said about the defensive line, I think is true about the offensive line. Right. We've seen one full practice. We've seen partials. I Today was the most... I've seen the offensive line because typically we're inside, we're up on a balcony, and then when the offensive line does their individual stuff, they go outside. Well, today everybody was outside, including us. So I could eavesdrop a little bit. I know Tyler was over there too some. So other than really general stuff, it's really hard to get an idea. I will say this. Riley Leonard was super complimentary. He knows that a quarterback should compliment his offensive line, and he was going up and down about how wonderful they are. So, right, Riley Leonard is pretty impressed. Uh, but I My, think to give ahead. you a a better idea, I think we need to see some scrimmage and competitive periods. Yeah, I was just going to add that Mike Dembrak was also very impressed with the offensive line. He. He described them as uh, his direct quote was, I've been as pleased with that group as I have with any group so far during the spring. So um, that's, that's a good sign in terms of what the offensive line has been doing. Um, But yeah, in terms of what we've seen, it's been very limited. Um, I think it's probably a good sign that we've seen the same five guys every time. Like it's the same starters so that, that you would tend to believe that those guys are continuing to play well and, um, play at a high level. Otherwise, we would see some more mixing and matching, which we haven't seen any of in terms of the offensive line starters that are lining up when we're there. Um, but yeah, in terms of being able to see them work together, 
um, Saturday will provide a, a really good look at that because we haven't really been able to get much much from what we've seen so far. One thing um, Jalen Sneed was asked about, and Micah Gilbert came up with him. He's the guy that everybody mentioned, but he mentioned Billy Shrouth and Cooper Flanagan at different positions as guys he was very have been very impressed with going against, and the two running backs at the top of the depth chart, Jadarian Price and uh, Jeremiah Love. But to throw Shrouth in there has impressed Jalen Sneed. Bob Bolt wants us to play a little place your bets. Uh, Christian Gray over or under five interceptions in 2024. I'm going to go under on that. I think he's certainly capable, uh, but I think interceptions, I, I, it's almost they'd have to be picking on him, which whoever's opposite of Ben Morrison, it seems like Might the smart strategy. <laughs> uh, but I'm not sure how if he's going to play enough between are Jaden Mickey and Christian Gray going to split that? I, I don't know. So I'm going to go under just to be on the safe side. Yeah, I, I would too, especially if it's at five. So meaning he has to get to six to go over that. The five, the five makes it a little bit more difficult. If it was four and a half, maybe you could go with the over. Uh, but it's, it's hard to predict interceptions like, Xavier Watts, he probably won't have as many interceptions as he did last year, just like Benjamin Morrison wasn't able to re repeat the amount of interceptions he had as a freshman. Uh, now maybe Christian Gray gets more opportunities because he is in a secondary with some more proven guys and he is less proven than them. Um, but I think it would be hard to predict six interceptions um, for what would be a, essentially a first-time starter for Notre Dame. Uh, Blyberg asked, uh, of all the football coaches – you have covered at Notre Dame, uh, including head coaches, assistant coaches, and coordinators, um, which was the most similar to Bob Knight in terms of personality. And that's obviously specific to you because you have Bob Knight experience. I do. I had a decade of Bob Knight experience. That was my first job out of college four decades ago was covering Indiana basketball. Um, the most similar in personality, there's nobody that really – comes close. I mean, language, Harry, he stand. Um, <laughs> I would say probably a personality, maybe Charlie Weiss, as far as maybe media and fans kind of stuff. Um, but I mean, maybe Lou Holtz in a really weird way in that the players, when they were playing for Lou, didn't like him. I mean, it wasn't until they were done with Lou Holtz that they embraced and they're like, man, I'm glad I'm done with them. I love you, Lou. So um, he was pretty hard in, on players and practice. I mean, it's hard to think of Lou and Bobby Knight, you know, this little skinny guy with a list versus a 6'6 big dude uh, that could probably be a pretty good tight end. Um, but uh, so those would be the closest comparisons, but nobody's in Bob Knight's class. All right. I think that's, I think we've got all the questions. There's one from Jeff Stevens about recruiting stuff, but we can get that. Well, we can get to recruiting here in a little bit. Okay. Uh, a couple of cleanup things really quick before we get in a, a quick peep of aqua, cause we're going to run out of time. Was there anything at practice that stood out to you that today that we haven't talked about? Um, well, in, in terms of the offensive line, uh, what was notable to me, Rocco Spindler was working at left guard um, in a number two role with the second team. So that made me wonder if uh, maybe Billy Strouth has sort of locked up that right guard position or become more of a sure thing there um, for Notre Dame. Uh, now, maybe it could be something completely different, but Rocco Spindler was taking reps as a left guard, as a number two left guard, and interviewed in some individual drills, doing some double team action with Ashton Craig. So I wonder if we're gearing up for a Rockwell Spindler, Pat Coogan battle at the left guard spot uh, with, with Billy Strouth at right guard. Um, other than that, we talked about Riley Leonard. I don't really know if there was anything else that was significant that I, that I was able to watch um, from today. What about you? I, I would agree. I think we've hit those. So I'm going to jump to, our um, conversations with the coordinators on Saturday. 
we've talked a little bit about what Mike Denbrock and Al Golden had to say. This was our first interview with Al Golden since December. Um, and so he has since signed his contract extension. But let's start with Denbrock first. Anything that we haven't mentioned from his conversation that you'd like to share? Um, I, I, I opened by asking how the, how the offense is progressing. And he said he loves it and he hates it. I thought it was kind of funny. He sort of joked that uh, he likes the way every, everything – he likes everything the players are doing and how they're approaching things. Um, they need to be more consistent and drill down on some of the details and, and sort of how the defense uh, impacts them to sort of um, – be able to take best advantage of that. I think that sounds like it was maybe reflected. I think you were talking about what Kenny Minchie said in terms of like making the adjustments based on what the defense is doing. And that sounds like something that where Notre Dame has in, is in this process uh, with its offense um, of trying to get everything installed and then also taking it to the next level because uh, Mike Denbrock has continued to be the voice of an offensive coordinator uh, that goes against Al Golden in spring practices. It's like it, – uh, I love Al Golden, but sometimes it's going to be a p real pain <laughs> trying to go up against his defenses when we're trying to install stuff. Uh, so um, that 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 was interesting. Um, Mike Denbrock talked about how last week they did really well on a goal line drill running the football, but the, the passing game maybe wasn't necessarily at the same level. So that's where the improvement is there. I mean, that's not terribly surprising, given all the new receivers and the quarterback situation. Um. 11 personnel has been like the talk of the spring football, both from, I think mostly from the players. Honestly, when you talk to skill players, they talk about how Mike Denbrock's offense is very 11 personnel heavy. Um, Mike Denbrock isn't necessarily committing to that right now. Like that's what the personnel that Notre Dame has available in the spring is best suited for 11 personnel. Um, so when it gets some of its tight ends back um, and has some more options, then maybe there's something else there, but a big part of the 11 personnel is the slot receiver. And that is something that Mike Denbrock has lots of uh, thoughts about in terms of trying to get a really good receiver um, matched up on maybe the third best cornerback on the field. So um, I think that will be, even if it's not 11 personnel, they'll probably have some slot receiver alignments to try to take advantage of some situations like that. Um, he will go to the NFL draft. It's funny. Mike Denbrock doesn't usually say the word LSU or the name LSU. Like he was talking about when he was talking about some of the slot stuff that Malik Neighbors did last year. He's like that place I was at last year or whatever. Uh, but he will go to the draft. He's never been to the draft. So I think he's excited to see um, how things play out for Jaden Daniels, Malik Neighbors, and Brian Thomas Jr., all, all three um, offensive players that are projected to go in the first round of, of this year's draft. And I will say for the record, when I asked Mitchell Evans about, do you think Mike Denbrock's offense is tight end friendly? He's like, oh, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> he anticipates that the balance of power will shift back a little bit more toward middle ground once all those tight ends are uh, in place again and healthy. Um, as far as Al Golden, to me, what stood out was his demeanor is hilarious because you would think that he was preparing for Caleb Williams this week. Um, <laughs> that's the urgency he brings to practice. I mean, he's loaded on defense, but you wouldn't know it from the way he goes about things. And so there is a real sense of urgency. And what he said was, you can't carry last year's success forward. There's a lot you can learn from it, take from it, but it's a new team with new strengths, new weaknesses, new leadership. And so you're, you're, there is an element of it where you are kind of starting from scratch, and that's what they're trying to build this spring. In terms of him coming back, you know, he said that, uh, I, you know, what I read between the lines was if this wasn't Notre Dame, he wouldn't be back probably. He would have looked at some others, but he loves the kind of athlete that he's dealing with at Notre Dame. And when you're fifth in the country in total defense, I think it makes it a lot more fun and four of your best players come back and Howard Cross, Riley Mills, uh, Jack Kaiser and Xavier Watts. So, yeah. So, sorry for butting in earlier. I just didn't want people thinking Riley no, Leonard was missing I practice know. for masters. Courses. I know I'm going to get the Riley's mixed up <laughs> and they don't even spell their first name the same. So, um, but uh, it, it, 
you know, he talked about some of the things that they had to accomplish this spring. And uh, again, I think you talk to the players and they are just so um, respectful of his knowledge of the game, how he has in-game adjustments, how he puts together game plans. I think it's going to be really exciting to see what they're able to do this year. We are really running out of time quickly. So as far as the Pete Pavacqua interview, we had a three-part series on Pete Pavacqua. I got a one-on-one -on -one with him last week. I would urge you to read it because we can't possibly go through everything yeah, here. Yeah. Tyler, was there anything while, that... Well, Actually, while you talk, I'm going to put a link to it in the in the chat so people can check it out if they haven't already. Okay. So so you tell us what was, what was the most or the most intriguing parts to you in terms of what you learned from the conversation you had with him. For me, I put the I think the most intriguing stuff was in part one, and that's Pete Bavakwa's urgency that not only does he think Notre Dame can win a national championship, he thinks they have to. And he thinks they have to under Marcus Freeman. And he also feels like the things are in place to be able to do that. So you can read the story and see what his reasoning is for that, um, including the Goog expansion um and what's going to be important in what they're going to have when they expand the goog which uh will be here soon uh part two was kind of the front burner issue so this is more of the day-to-day -day stuff that he's dealing with now and that's um you know getting ready for a possible playoff game in december how they're going to do that how they're going to keep the opposing teams out and how they're doing that in regular season games. You saw the Ohio state game was very different than the seas of red with Georgia and way back in the day, Nebraska, which, which Pete was actually at that game as a fan, um, not as a Nebraska fan though. Um, so some of the, the day-to-day -day stuff that he's dealing with. And then the third part was really kind of looking at the future, the, how the student athlete model is evolving. Um, how he needs to be a voice for Notre Dame on the national front to keep their seat at the table with all this change going around them. And um, so again, I think you'll need to read the story to get you know a deeper dive on some of those issues um, and how they affect Notre Dame. But I was really impressed. And there's some interesting stuff that he said. Again, I'm going to circle back to the first part about the media rights deal which he did have a hand in helping negotiate, having been a former NBC executive during his um, kind of eight-month on-ramp as an apprentice of sorts to Jack Swarbrick. And I think some of those comments are really interesting. Really personable guy. I think Notre Dame absolutely made the right hire there, and uh, I'm really eager to see what he does. All right. Uh, I have a few more questions here. I'll, you can fit in and then we can talk a little bit recruiting and then probably wrap up after that. Um, questions from is you 39 Jadarian price Jadarian price was running with the ones today. Apparently does this mean anything? Yeah, it means he and Jeremiah love are the two guys at the top of the depth chart and you're going to see each of them get those kind of opportunities and sometimes on the field at the same time. So Absolutely, it it means something. Those two are out in front. Yeah, uh, I would say I don't know that. Like what what we saw today was like okay, Jadarian Price is a clear running back, clear running back run. Like we were just there and they were doing some tempo drills. Uh, Jadarian and Jeremiah Love are going to have a very uh, uh, both have plenty of opportunities to carry the ball for Notre Dame this season, um, and so um, it's just a continuation of what price has done this spring and uh, at the end of last season to put himself in a position to, to be one of the lead backs for Notre Dame this season. D Brasco 22 said, who's going to replace cross and Mills's talent level and production next year. I, I think their hope is that Gabe Rubio is one of those guys. Um, Jason Anye, Donovan Heinish, I think will be in that mix. Um, we mentioned Sean Sevillano Jr. Um, who am I? Oh, Brennan Vernon is a guy that they're hoping comes along at defensive tackle. Yep. We haven't seen a lot of Tyson Ford yet. So, um, 
And uh, Devin Houston was scout team player of the week two or three times last week. I don't know that we've seen as much of him lately. And then Notre Dame is recruiting well at the position. So, um, but I would say Gabe Rubio and Jason Anye would be the two guys with maybe Heinish as the third yeah. guy right now. Yeah, I, I would agree with everything you said there. I think those are the guys that are in the mix and um, whether or not they can match their production and talent level remains to be seen. I think Riley Mills, in terms of like talent and physical raw traits, is hard to match. He's just a very freakish athlete um, in size and stature and, and strength. Um, but obviously there's other ways that you can, you can play the position. Um, so I think Notre Dame has guys there that um, Al Washington is continuing to develop. And I think those guys will also have opportunities to, to sort of prove what they can do um, in reserve roles this, this coming season, because there'll be plenty of rotating up front. I think the goal would be for Notre Dame to be more comfortable in taking cross and mills off the field at times um, to keep them maybe fresher than they were at times last year. Um, because those those reserve interior defensive linemen are more capable to handle what, what they're being asked to do. And if there's unexpected injuries or departures with some of the people that we mentioned, there's always the transfer portal. All right. Um, let's uh, let's just jump into the recruiting talk with a question from Jeff Stevens. Um, Jeff asked, any 2026 targets that could commit soon? From the recent visits, what do you expect from Jadon Blair, 2025 safety, in the next few months? Um, in terms of the 2026 targets, I, I don't know that I, I get a sense that anyone's ready to commit soon. Um, I, Based on the guys that visited last week, the three that I think are the most likely to end up in Notre Dame's class of that visited um, would be defensive end Braden Jones, a three-star recruit out of Chicago Mount Carmel, um, four-star linebacker Samu Moala out of Lawndale, California, um, and then four-star quarterback Brady Hart um, out of Cocoa, Florida. I think that is the odds-on favorite from my perspective to be Notre Dame's quarterback in the 2026 class. But in terms of like when those guys will commit, I don't, I don't, I'm not putting anything on them deciding soon necessarily. It's it, a lot of those guys are getting out and visiting places. I think. The quarterback situation for Notre Dame will probably be wrapped up by the end of the summer um, would be the goal. Um, but uh, Notre Dame certainly in a good spot with both Brady Hart and Noah Grubbs in the 2026 class for quarterbacks. Um, as for Jadon Blair, um, I think Notre Dame made a really good impression on him um, and got himself right back in the mix. I think Penn State is sort of the perceived leader there. Um, I think they're sort of neck and neck now. And so, We'll see. He's got, a, uh, I think, seven official visits scheduled, um, and that'll tell us what he wants to do because he plans to decide on July 5th, which is his birthday. Um, I had a story on Jadon Blair, if you haven't seen Thank it. Thank goodness his birthday is on July 4th. Yeah, no. Uh, we've done the we've done the 4th of the July commitments before, the, but there was the one year where there was two. Um, I can't remember both of them. I know one was Brendan Clark, but I don't remember who the other one was. We had a um, Christmas Eve one one time. I was Troy Pride Jr. Never forget that. Because yeah, <laughs> I had my grandson wouldn't let me put him down. He was a baby at the time. And I had to post your story uh, one-handed as I held Maurizio in my left hand. So, yeah, I think the Blair recruitment is getting interesting. And I think Notre Dame really wants him. And I think there's, there's a connection that's being made there. They had some ground to make up a little bit because – Chris O'Leary is no longer on staff and had a really good relationship with, with Jadon Blair. Anything else recruiting wise we need to hit? There were a lot of people. There's so many people there Saturday. We had to actually do interviews in a different place because they were all upstairs and they don't like the media to mingle with the recruits and their parents. Um, I, I saw in the, in the chat, people were talking about Tanook Hines a little bit. Um, he would be, other than Jadon Blair, he would be the other guy that visited last week in the 2025 class that I feel the best about for Notre Dame. Um, and what position a, is he? A, a speedy wide receiver out of Houston, Texas. Um, I'm I'm more convinced now than ever that if as long as Notre Dame can get five guys, they will take five guys at wide receiver. Um, I know that for for the longest time we were talking about it, be, it just being four. 
Um, but I think Notre Dame will push to five, especially if you can get, for instance, like Derek Meadows into the kinds in the class. So um, that was a good visit for Notre Dame. I had an Intel piece uh, on the insider lounge message board for our subscribers that if you're not a subscriber, I, I suggest you check it out. Uh, make sure it, it's worth subscribing for, at least in my humble opinion. Um, and then I also later this week, I'll have a heat in, index update um, with where uh, the Rams stands with this remaining 2025 targets. Some guys sort of falling off the list in terms of um, guys that are uh, that Notre Dame is still recruiting. Um, and then some sort of guys rising up in terms of Notre Dame being in better shape with. Okay. Well, we're well into overtime. Do we want to hit anything else before we go? One last question from Carberry Q. Do you guys think Angeli starts at Texas A&M if Riley Leonard isn't up to speed with the offense chemistry-wise? Yes, if he's not up to speed with the offense chemistry-wise, but that would mean another setback from an injury standpoint. He's going to have all summer to work with those guys and all fall camp, and if he doesn't beat – Steve Angeli out, then Steve Angeli will be the starter and I think do a very good job. But I do still expect Riley Leonard to be the starter on August 31st. Yeah. Barring more injury setbacks, I would I would predict he would be the starter as well. Um it would have to be like a very he would have to look very bad, I think, in, in order to sort of be leaped by Steve Angeli, or Steve Angeli would have to look like um Joe Burrow <laughs> to, to sort of lose for, for it to go a different way. Uh, That's in Kenny Minchie's right favorite quarterback. Is um, Joe Burrow. So, um, yeah, I think uh, um, I, I would say Riley Leonard will still be the starter for the Texas A&M game as long as he's healthy. All right. Uh, that's all I have, Eric. Uh, I'll do a plug one more time for our 30 day trial to inside If you are a new subscriber, you want to check out, the heat index or Intel from recruiting visits or so any of our other premium content. Um, you can sign up using the promo code NDYT um, for a free 30 day trial uh, to inside ND sports.com. Um, and uh, you can ask us questions all the time. You don't have to wait till we're live on YouTube um, and we'll, we'll hang out with you there. We have a good community of folks that are always asking questions and um, chiming in with different things going on. We were talking about, what all, we were all doing for the eclipse yesterday, which I don't know if it, what Eric did. Did you do anything for the eclipse yesterday, Eric? I vacuumed my sun porch and <laughs> kind of watched the shadow get bigger and then not bigger. I didn't look at the sun. I didn't have the special glasses. I I had an extra pair. I should have sent sent them to you. Um, but uh, appreciate everyone uh, that chimed uh, chimed in tonight. Uh, make sure you're subscribed to us here on the channel on YouTube. Hit the bell for reminders uh, when we have content in the future and hit the like button on this. Smash the like button, as the kids say. Um, so we will be back next week. Football never sleeps. Next um, Monday. We'll be back to Monday. Back to Monday. So We, we moved so Zach, Eddie, and Gene Katie could watch us. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good week.